Alrighty, guys. So we are going to be reading uh, Tangerine, the prologue. So here is the beginning of Tangerine. The house looked strange. It was completely empty now, and the door was flung wide open, like something wild had just escaped from it, like it was the empty two-story tomb of some runaway zombie. Mom called out to me, take the bag, Paul. I want to have one last look around. I said, I just did. I didn't see anything. Well, maybe you didn't look everywhere. I'll just be a minute. I looked everywhere. Wait for me by the car, please. We can't have the new owners thinking we left a mess behind. I picked up the garbage bag and hauled it out to the curb. We had already packed up our sleeping bag, suitcases, and two folding chairs, all neatly wedged into the back of Mom's Volvo wagon. Not only this 10-gallon self-tying lemon-scented garbage bag remained, and we planned to toss it into the dumpster behind the 7-Eleven. But first, Mom had to make sure that I didn't look overlook anything. She was worried that the people who bought our house, people who we'd never met, would find a McDonald's swizzle stick and think less of us. Once we dump this garbage bag, that'll be it. That'll be the last evidence that the Fisher family ever lived in Houston. Dad and my brother, Eric, are already gone. They've been living in Florida for a week now with the sleeping bags, suitcases, and chairs that they stuffed into Dad's Range Rover. The rest of our furniture left yesterday, professionally packed by two guys who came to really hate mom. By now, it should be over halfway to our new address, a place called Lake Windsor Downs in Tangerine County, Florida. I set the garbage bag down and leaned against the station wagon, staring east directly into the rising sun. I'm not supposed to do that because my glasses are so thick. My brother, Eric, once told me that if I ever look directly into the sun with these glasses, my eyeballs will burst into flame like dry leaves under a magnifying glass. I don't believe that, but I turn back around anyway, and I look west down our street at the receding line of black mailboxes. Something about them fascinated me. I leaned my chin against the top of the station wagon and continued to stare. An old familiar feeling came over me, like I had forgotten something. What was it? What did I need to remember? Somewhere behind me, a car engine started up, and a scene came back to me. I remembered a black metal mailbox on a black metal pole. I was riding my bike home at dinner time, heading east down this street, with the sun setting behind me. I heard a loud roar like an animal's, like a predator snarling. I swiveled my head around, still pedaling, and looked back. All I could see was the red sun, huge now, setting right over the middle of the street. I couldn't see anything else, but I could hear the roar even louder now, and I recognized it, the roar of an engine revved up to full throttle. I tilted up my sports goggles to unfog them, then I turned back and saw it, a black car, just an outline at first, then clear and detailed. It came right out of the sun. I saw a man hanging out of the passenger window, hanging way out. He had something pulled over his face, some kind of ski mask, and he was holding a long metal baseball bat in both hands like a murder weapon. Then the gears ground, the tires squealed, and the car leaped forward at an impossible speed. I swiveled back, terrified, and pedaled as hard as I could. I heard the roar of the car closing in on me, louder and louder, like it had smelled its prey. I shot a glance into my bike mirror, and there it was, half a block behind, then 10 yards, then one yard. The man in the ski mask leaned farther out the window. He pulled the bat back and up. Then he brought it toward, forward in a mighty swing right at my head. I dove to the right, landing on my face in the grass, just as the baseball bat smashed into the mailbox, exploding it right off its pole. Voices inside the car screamed, animal fury screams, as the crushed black metal clattered across the street. I scrambled back up. I left my bike there, its wheels spinning, and ran for home. I ran in absolute terror, listening for the sound of the car squealing back around to come after me again. I burst through the front door, crying hysterically. My goggles were twisted back around my head. I spun around and around, looking for Mom. Then Mom and Dad were both in front of me, holding on to my shoulders, trying to calm me down, trying to understand the word that I was saying over and over. It was Eric, I was saying, Eric! Finally, Dad finally understood. He looked right into my eyes and asked, what do you mean by Eric? Eric what, Paul? I stammered out, Eric, he tried to kill me. 
Mom and dad let go of my shoulders and stepped back. They looked at each other, puzzled. Then dad raised his arm and pointed to the right and to the dining room. There was Eric. He was sitting at the dining room table. He was doing his homework. Dad eyeballed me for a few seconds. Then he went out front to look for my bike. Eric called over, there he goes, blaming me again. Mom took me into the kitchen and got me a glass of water. She ran her finger under the strap of my goggles and slipped them off. Then she said, honey, you know how it is with your eyesight. You know you can't see very well. And that was that. But I can see. I can see everything. I can see things that mom and dad can't or won't. Mom's voice broke into my remembrance. Paul? My chin was still pressed against the car. She was standing next to me. Paul, are you with us? I leaned back as she beeped the auto alarm and opened the tailgate. You're remembering all the good times you had here, aren't you? I shook my head to clear it. I reached to pick up the garbage bag. My arms felt weak and I muttered, I was remembering, I was remembering something that happened. She held up a white cigarette butt and said, you don't know anything about this, do you? No, I found it in the garage behind the water heater. I opened up the garbage bag enough for her to slip it inside. I said, good work, mom. She pulled quick, she quickly walked back up to the house, laid her keys inside the foyer and pulled the door firmly closed. And that was that. The keys were locked in, the zombie was locked out, and we were on our way.